Hello and welcome to the Michael Collins House podcast. My name is Jamie Murphy and this time on our podcast we have distinguished historian and author Mita Ryan on to discuss Tom Barry, the Cork Third Brigade and their particularly active period in the Irish War of Independence in early 1921. This podcast is part of our 1921 Irish War of Independence commemorative program supported by Cork County Council and the Cork County Council Commemorations Committee. Many of you know of Mida from her hugely popular books including The Day Michael Collins Was Shot, Michael Collins and the Women Who Spied for Ireland, Liam Lynch The Real Chief and her most recent Thomas Kent biography from the 16 Lives series. Arguably her most famous text is the Tom Barry story from 1982 or Tom Barry IRA Freedom Fighter as it is now known in its revised form. Much of the content of this podcast will be based on the content from that particular book so if you enjoy what you hear in this podcast I would advise you pick up a copy for further insight. In a shameless plug for our own gift shop, yes we do stock it. Now for those who don't know who Mida is, she is originally from West Cork and as you will hear from this podcast is a wealth of knowledge uh, on the conflict in this region. Her views and insight in the topic is shaped by her local knowledge, research and interviews she has carried out with many of the people who are directly involved in the events she discusses. She has never been one to shy from debate or controversy in the telling of their first-hand accounts. What she will discuss here today will cover early 1921, the lead up to the events of a period Tom Barry would refer to as the 12 Dark Days, during which the Cork 3rd Brigade suffered 11 fatalities in different events. Significant conflicts were occurring on almost a daily basis during this time, and if you are following us on social media, we have been chronicling many of these events in brief um, as their centenaries occur. It's great to be able to add more substance to these through this podcast and to hear the events recounted as they were told by people involved in them. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Mita Ryan to present The Twelve Dark Days. Enjoy. Tom Barry was certainly a freedom fighter. He was engaged in many well-known ambushes, but today I want to discuss an important period in Irish history and especially in West Cork. Will show how important it was to a strong, decisive, and competent commander as Tom Barry was of the Third West Cork Brigade Flying Column. Since early December 1920, the British government had engaged in indirect negotiations with the leaders of Sinn Féin and was, according to the Times, exploring avenues to peace. Archbishop Clune of Australia had met and acted as intermediary between Lord George and the Irish leaders, especially Michael Collins. Meanwhile, the terror continued. Scores of unarmed volunteers and their supporters were arrested and many were tortured. In West Cork, civilians were beaten. Many homes, factories and creameries were burned. The auxiliaries, black and tans, and the military were daily raiding homes. As 1921 began, Tom Barry and Charlie Hurley, O.C. of the brigade, talked. Charlie had disbanded the flying column after the 8th of December gag and ambush and was discussed and was upset. He felt he had handled it badly. Tom assured him he had done his best. Together they'd make it. During December, Tom Barry had been secretly treated in hospital due to a heart condition, but was now back with the column in early 1921. When the Irish problem came up in the British House of Commons, Cork again was the county to be dreaded. So troops were poured into Bantry, Bear Island, Bandon, Bellancolic, Cork City, Thermoy and Cove. At headquarters in O'Manis, Belrose, Barry, Charlie Hurley, Sean Buckley, Dean D.C. and other officers of the 3rd West Cork Brigade discussed the future. They decided to get going again. They had to find out if Bishop Collins' threat would have an effect on the men, so they made a tour of the company. Bishop Collins had issued an excommunication order against the IRA and the carrying of arms. Barry insisted that men should be told that anyone who felt because of religious scruples unable to carry on in the IRA was free to leave. Not one man in any company did so, said Jim Carney. We were convinced that Tom was one of the greatest 
pleasers of all times. Any man who went out on the road to stop the lorries as he did in Kilmichael wouldn't we do anything for him. Men would even die for him. Policy and strategy were outlined. Each battalion was instructed to send riflemen to reform the brigade flying column, which was to mobilise on the 18th of January 1921. Meanwhile, the Bandon Battalion section was to assemble immediately to carry out the first attack of the new year. Shortage of arms was the biggest problem, so attacks were made on Kilbritton in the Channel and Bandon Barracks. Two well-planned attacks on Kilbritton Barracks failed because explosives did not work. A raid on Inish and on barracks in a fortified village was their next target. If this inconvenient building could be destroyed and the arms captured, Charlie Hurley and Barry decided the difficulties that the Bandon Battalion now experienced would be removed. To find out the feasibility of a raid, Barry and Hurley crept quietly down the village at 1 a.m. on the 17th of January 1921. Even if they had been innocent, unarmed civilians, this action would have rendered them liable to arrest and punishment, since the curfew was now strictly enforced. Crouching beneath the shadows of the houses, the two men came within 20 yards of the police barracks, fired six rounds at its shutters from their automatics, and then ran back to watch. Immediately from the barracks, Gunfire started, and a moment later, the flare of rockets lit the winter sky. The two men had proof that this barracks was prepared. Troops from Bandon, Dunmanway, and other areas would be on the way shortly. Barry and Charlie Hurley made their way to the high ground and waited. Below, defenders of the police barracks continued to fire at nothing. The two smiled with satisfaction at this venture, and also at how easily they had acquired their information. Fifty minutes after this foray, Norris was seen approaching in a Shannon from the Brinney direction on the northern road. Satisfied, the two men returned to headquarters. At headquarters, they received a welcome cargo from Michael Collins in Dublin. Leslie Price, Charlie Hurley's girlfriend with Maya Llewellyn Davies, intelligence officer, had motored from Dublin with wrapped guns and ammunition hidden in cases of ladies' clothes and underwear. Sometimes when they came, their hard cargo was hidden in bags of flour. Leslie Price, the chief organizer for Common Amman, had been traveling on her bicycle throughout West Cork, as well as countrywide, setting up membership groups. Periodically on visits to GHQ Dublin, she'd return with guns in her luggage. She did quite a few missions with Maya in her motor car, transporting guns from Michael Collins to the Cork Brigade. Michael Collins, known to them as Mick, often sent notes to Leslie. The notes began with Dearest Leslie or Leslie Dears or some such endearment and signed Love M. This would give the impression of a love note if intercepted. General Strickland in an interview said that many in many cases, arms would be brought out for use at a scene of an ambush or an attack by women who conceal them in their skirts. They are that the, the army's good method of getting at women was to raid houses, he said. At this time, Barry organized two days of intensive training of 70 riflemen. This was the strongest number in the flying column to date. Equipped with arms and ammunition, Barry divided his men into seven sections and moved to take up positions at Marbeg, five miles outside of Bandon on the Balmain Road. Most days of the week, a convoy of five lorries of the first Essex traveled from Bandon on this road. The plan was to ambush them. The men lay in wait from early morning on the 22nd of January, but after seven hours of anticipation, with no sign of British troops, Barry reluctantly decided to withdraw his column. Next day, he with his men took up positions again a little closer to Bender. Another long, fruitless wait followed. Through their intelligence section, word beat Barry that the barracks had been aware of the column. The largest column yet mustered it. Barry decided that they should not be mobilized in vain. So in sections, he marched the men across the Bandon River 
to a pre-arranged meal in a number of houses and villages. He had tried to get Bend and Forces out one way, now he would try another. Curfew and Bend was between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. An Essex patrol consisting of an officer of 45 men marched out of the barracks on the North Main Street each night at 10.30 p.m. Barry decided to attack this patrol. The timing of the whole operation was a matter of precise calculation. Barry divided his men into sections. As a masking device, two sections were positioned to attack black and tan posts in the northern side of the town with the third on the main DC to attack the barracks at the western end. The main body of the flying column were placed at Shandon Street, that's now Oliver Prunker Street, the point furthest on the barracks where the military curfew party generally made their about turn. A barricade against armoured cars was set up in a lane to which the IRA was to withdraw. All various sections were to reach positions at precisely 11.05 p.m. Simultaneously, attacks were to last on post for seven minutes. The men were well schooled as to their actions. Midnight passed and no patrol appeared. By 2.55 a.m., it looked as if the enemy was in possession of an information. Harry asked himself if he were commander of the opposing force, what would he do? Instantly, he visualized troops from all surrounding barracks encircling them. However, Barry felt some form of attack was necessary if only from a point of view of morale for his men. He brought the detached section into action. They opened fire on the barracks, but nobody came out. Immediately, he fired his signal shot to his men to withdraw. Soon, incoming enemy fire began to crackle. Daddy knew informers that sold to stand. However, he discovered that the column could penetrate the heart of the most dreaded enemy garrison in the area, and the enemy failed to tackle them. So there was some fighting close to the military barracks where volunteer Dan O'Reilly was killed. Also elsewhere, the Essex Regiment killed two unarmed volunteers, Pat O'Donovan and Dennis Hagerty, in mid-January. Still at this point, the male's morale, which had risen after Kilmichael, continued to rise with Barry at the helm to a new peak of confidence. It wasn't for the want of trying that there were no major engagements. The IRA were active, and it affected the British troops more. Barry said we entered Bend in a garrison town at least 40 to 50 times. It was necessary to keep on the offensive and to be aggressive. No time was to be lost. Barry and Charlie Hurley prepared to put what they had learned from the dummy attack on Inishana into operation. On the night following the Benden affair, Barry posted 18 riflemen at Brinney on a by road in the Inishana direction. Ten men took up positions on the direct road between Benden and Inishana, and ten more covered the Inishana Cork Road. Barry with 32 riflemen were positioned for the actual attack on Inner Shannon Barracks. Three parties of four men were placed to open fire on the back side and the west side windows and doors of the barracks to prevent any inmates from bursting out. The remaining 20 men were equally divided into sections. They laid a mine and Barry himself was prepared to rush the front door when the explosion went off. The plunger was depressed, depressed, but no explosion followed. Riflemen opened fire. The military in the barracks sent up rockets, and after much shooting and wasting of ammunition by the column, nothing really happened. Silently, Barry cursed himself for this dummy attack. He also cursed the useless and explosive. They must try to find an explosive expert, he thought. He said, Rifle and revolver bullets were about as useful as snowballs against those strong enemy forces. He left four men behind to keep the garrison busy and marched the rest of the column northwest to Brenny and on to Newsystem, which they reached on the morning of the 28th of January 1921. 
that he was aware of the courage of his men prepared to walk into towns and villages and openly attack fortified barracks. He sent two small sections to house the band and enemy posts and prevent them from resting, while the flying column moved off to Ahiol to Billy. Now he set his sights on the well-fortified Roscabry barracks. Tom Kenton, a British loyalist known as Lord Tom, was the owner of Burgesha House, a large mansion a mile outside Roscabry. Through the IRA civil courts, he was charged with espionage, as well as constantly conveying information on IRA activities. He secretly carried on military mail between Roscabry and Clonakilty enemy garrison. Expecting a long and arduous battle at Roscabry, Barry decided to take the family hostage and billet his men for a day's rest. It was a daring idea with the house so close to Roscabry and retreat cut off by the sea, but Barry had a plan made and scouts were well placed. Barry found that a continual worry for him were what he called the nests of British loyalists when he was preparing for engagement. There was a possibility that an informer would see the flying column pass and slip in to report the forces that the IRA were preparing for ambush. It required constant vigilance. At 3 a.m., the column moved in and took Lord Tom and held him host- his household hostage. The house was well stocked. So Tyke Sullivan took charge of feeding the men. He, with a few more men, prepared a great feed of bacon, eggs, bread, butter, and tea for all. John Ello Sullivan and Paul Leahy were to meet Lark Cunningham and go into Clannacilty to bring out a suspected spy for trial at Trascabry. John L. recalls, we set out walking from Castle Freak to meet Cunningham. When we met at Clannacilty, he told us that the order was countermanded. We were to go to Ballyvacky and pick up our rifles there and go to Sam's Cross where orders would be left for us. We went on, picked up our rifles, and then on to Marles Collins' house. It was four o'clock in the morning, and Marles came down the stairs to tell us that Barry left instructions that we were to go to the column at not at that hour, as he was afraid of the dogs barking and other noise to draw attention where the column was. So we were to go back and be with the column at half nine in the morning. John L. told me... We both went home as we felt being on the run, we may not have a chance of being home for a long time again. When I think of the iron of it, I was just coming down the stairs at half past eight in the morning when the British military who had come on cycle patrol were inside in the hall before me. Janelle was then arrested, questioned and knocked about. She was certain that only for Father Hurley arriving on a sick call, he would have been severely beaten that morning. Blood was already flowing from his mouth. He was sent to Spike Island, where we, he got a woeful doing, he told me, and then in Marlborough print, left in Marlborough prison uh, until the truce was signed. Back in Borgesia House, Lord Tom was put on trial. Barry led the questioning, which continued for over an hour. Since the beginning of the year, Barry had become very conscious of the menace of spies. Lord Tom admitted that he had been secretly engaged in carry out, carrying dispatches between Ross Carberry, Dunmanway, and Planet Hintley garrisons. During their intelligence mail raids, Barry said, we wondered why there was no mail going to Ross Carberry. Lord Tom confessed he constantly took the mail in his motor car. He was only trying to organize an anti-treaty, an anti Sinn party in the interests of peace, he explained. In summing up, Barry told Kingston that he deserved to die. The evidence of spying against the army of the elected government of his own country was strong against him, but not conclusive. He would spare his life as he had not caused the death of any member of the IRA. Once this siege is over, Lord Tom, uh, he told Lord Tom that he would have 24 hours to leave the country. His house would be burned, his property would be fortified to the Irish Republic to be distributed to the brigade men in the area who were without means of subsistence as it had originally been taken from the Irish people during the plantation. 
Lord Tom appeared surprised and relieved that he was not to be shot. He went to his room and had only left when Jack Corkery rushed in and announced the arrival of the postman. This man was a former regular soldier in the British Army. Barry believed that this man, if left to complete his rounds, would report the IRA's presence. However, not returning could cause trouble. When he was brought to Barry and questioned, he said he was in sympathy with the IRA and swore on Lord Tom's Bible that he would go quietly on his rounds and say nothing. He was released at 12.30 p.m. Three and a half hours later, sentries noted movements of black and tans in the woods and further reports indicated the army lorries had been sighted. The postman had sold the day. Barry sent a man unarmed as a civilian on horseback one of Lord Tom's horses to monitor movements. Mick DC column sentry with a revolver stayed in the adjoining avenue and covered the rider. Short were fired at the horse from the military who were in concealed positions. Barry had, of course, foreseen this possibility. Immediately, he ordered the volunteers into their positions. Their backs were to the sea, and ammunition was, as always, scarce. The only way open to them was to fight their way out, but with only 40 rounds for each rifle, Barry had a haunting fear of unsettlement. He ordered his men into their strategic positions. Some sections would have to move swiftly outside, but not yet. He warned them not to fire until he blew the whistle. The enemy opened fire from a distance, smashing windows. They dropped down and continued to advance firing, but got no response. They were knocking sparks off the stones of the house. Puzzled, they moved closer as Barry had hoped. He blew the whistle. A burst of IRA fire rang out. Instantly, the enemy scattered off in disorder. Barry dispatched further sections to follow up until eventually all was quiet. John Welton, Pat Butmer, and many of the column men there that day told me of their experience. The incident shows the discipline of Barry's men. Had only one of them panicked and disobeyed orders, the outcome would have been disastrous for the column, as encirclement and reinforcements would soon follow. Jim Carney told me there was one amazing feature about Barry. When he set up an ambush, he never looked for a line of retreat. He went out to fight and to win. He always thought positively. If you look at many of the ambushes, said Carney, take Kilmichael and Borgesia. If the tables were turned, if it went the other way, they would be wiped out. In open countryside or at the water's edge, there was no means of retreat. Barry went out to win, and when he did, said Carney. Borgesia House had to be burned that night. To wait would add to the possibility that the house would be heavily guarded later. Barry sent his men off to billets. Then with Jim Hurley and Con O'Leary, he returned, piled the furniture, sprinkled the place with paraffin, and set the house ablaze. In anticipation, he waited in hiding with his two companions for an hour, but the tens of auxiliaries did not come out. At 10 p.m., the three men moved off. They circled Ross Carberry until they got behind the barracks and in sheltered position, crouched behind the wall, overlooking the barracks, they opened fire on the soldiers who were moving around. Soon the enemy retaliated heavily and accurately. The men escaped through the hills and went off to join the column at Tilbury. Barry had intended that the men would be well rested and ready to take on Rathscarbury barracks, but the postman who informed the military foiled that attack. However, the success of the escape at Borgesia House ambush boosted the men's morale, and it also showed the British force that the IRA was a strong army. According to Barry, some attack on the enemy in Rathscarbury on the night of Burgess ambush was imperative as a matter of prestige. This was a typical of Barry's tactics. After the abandoned raid, he remained behind with nine men to use some rifles. After Kilbritton, he was one of four. In Shannon, he remained with three and now with two others in Rathscarbury. He decided on this demonstration as proof that the IRA was always prepared for more. 
British propaganda reporting went into action. Michael Collins, whose elusiveness and daredevil deeds in Dublin were great at the time, so the Daily Sketch reported that he led an ambush on a white horse in Burgessia near his West Cork home place. The report said, 20 constables were attacked by 400 rebels. Michael Collins wrote in a letter to his sister Helena, Oh, lovely. The white horse story was an exaggeration. I have not written a white horse since I rode Gypsy and used her mane as a bridle. The propaganda publicity department stated that the rebels lost six dead, but the constables suffered no casualties. But no casualties meant no compensation. Yet claims were heard by the county court and reported in the press on the 25th of April, which stated the constabulary who claimed compensation showed a fine sense of loyalty in repeating on oath the fictions of Dublin Castle, adding the romantic detail that the rebel cohorts had seven campfires and their numbers by the time the claims came to be heard had risen to 500 rebels. Head Constable Down swore that during the fight a bullet grazed his nose and went through his moustache, and he had suffered defective memory. He was awarded a thousand pounds. Sergeant Toomey, who fell and hurt his knee, was awarded thirty-five pounds, and a few of them felt nervous and received twenty-five pounds each. Others were awarded twenty-five pounds for incidents such as a rich swatch being hit when a bullet went through his sleeve. Anyhow, following it, the anticipated roundup began the following day. Barry decided with his column to trail the forces as they scoured the countryside. It lasted for two days. This was a risky method, but he told me they stepped cautiously. Though it was chancy to move behind them, he found the tactic worked well. On the 5th of February 1921, he went to John O'Mahony's Kilbreen to attend Kilmeen to attend a brigade council meeting. It lasted 12 hours. The citizens were taken to fine-tune their method of tracking the ring of spies and informers. Mail was to be intercepted and opened only by a responsible battalion officer, and there was to be closer liaison between the three Cork brigades. The trenching of roads was to be undertaken, but consideration had also to be given that while such directive could paralyse the enemy, it could also affect the movements of ordinary citizens. Therefore, a detailed responsible plan was drafted for each battalion. At this time, volunteer Joe O'Reilly of Bantry and Barney O'Driscoll duped a prominent loyalist with a loyalist affiliations to travel to Wales on a boat with a cargo of butter from Affidown Skibbereen, operated by the O'Regan family. When in Cardiff, they assured, ensured that the loyalists became indisposed to drink while the butter was unloaded and the ship's cargo reloaded. It was customary at the time for O'Regans to bring back home when they were travelled over with butter. On this occasion, a consignment of 170 rifles and 10,000 rounds of ammunition was placed in the hold before the coal was loaded. On arrival at the customs in Queenstown, the two IRA men paraded the loyalists up to the customs officer, who, on recognising him, invited the tree to tea. The boat then proceeded to the banks of the River Elm near Affidown Skibbereen, where the arms were transferred to butter boxes for dispatch to ba Tom Barry's flying column. In Skibbereen, Barry discovered apathy among the people towards the cause of nationalism in the early days of 1921. It was his intention to enliven the town. The town was garrisoned by a strong detachment of the King's Regiment, commanded by Colonel Hudson, a likable character, according to Barry. This regiment had maintained quite a degree of inactivity. On the 9th of February 1921, at about 8 p.m., Barry, with a column of 55, approached the town. Forty-three were left in ambush positions outside the town, and Barry led 
12 into the town to engage the enemy. Although they advanced within a short distance of the troops, no move was made to oppose them. When the volunteers opened fire, the sentries were withdrawn. Having shut out the street lamps, the IRA took up positions at street corners. A short while after this, a group of unarmed soldiers came out and were detained by the volunteers. They were sent off in a commandeer sidecar to a nearby farmhouse with orders from Barry that their escorts were to see that they were well fed and supplied with drink. A cheerful party developed, apparently. In the early hours of the morning, the soldiers, having been brought back to the town in a side count in a merry mood, sauntered back to the barracks singing rebel songs. If these soldiers had belonged to the Bandon Essex, Barry's treatment of them would have been totally different. The man who could shoot a spy or kill a soldier was capable of kindness to the enemy who did his work without showing cruelty. They were well treated. They were told that because that they were well treated because of their fair attitude to IRA prisoners. Barry and his party retired. They could hold the town, but they couldn't lure the forces from army garrisons. Day was dawning when the column reached billets north of Drimmy League. With a few men, Barry went in to rest. Scarberry direction to size up the barracks and town situation for a court forthcoming attack. He had just sent a section with Spud Murphy to Billis <clears throat> and was moving in the direction of Ross Scarberry when a small group of military opened fire on him and his two companions. Catty Hayes and two other common among members who had been out delivering a dispatch had passed the military. Crossing a field, they saw Spud Murphy's section and informed them. Soon they heard gunfire. Murphy guessed Barry was in trouble. He crossed the road, opened fire to confuse the enemy and give them the impression that they were trapped. This allowed Barry and his two companions to escape. Instantly, the military retreated to barracks. Barry then set his sights on the League barracks eight miles north of Skibbereen. He borrowed a respectable coat, accompanied by a common man member, and he drove through the village in a pony and trap to view the barracks and surroundings. On the 12th of February 1921, having first moved the civilians from the local houses to safety, he and 30 riflemen launched their attack. Again, the explosive failed to go off. Following this, Barry decided that unless they could get somebody to make proper explosives, shooting up barracks should be abandoned. He admitted he said more curses than prayers at this juncture. We couldn't even blow in a bloody door, he said. On the morning of the 16th of February, a dispatch with bad news reached Tom about a train ambush at Upton Station, led by his friend Charlie Horley on the previous day. Three IRA men were killed and one fatally wounded. Charlie was wounded in the face and six civilians, including a woman, were killed during the fight in which six soldiers were wounded. Tom got a horse, rode through the night to Charlie, arriving at Fort's Belly Muffry next morning. During the 10 days previous to the 15th of February except Sunday, 20 soldiers of the Essex First Essex had travelled each day in one carriage on the evening train from Cork to Bandon. Charlie decided to attack this target with 13 IRA volunteers. On that particular day, the soldiers left Cork in one compartment as usual, but at Kinsale Junction, about 36 other heavily armed soldiers joined them and mingled with the civilian passengers. Two scouts were detailed to travel on the train to indicate the carriage positions of the troops. Through a misadventure, the men did not get on the train. When it stopped at Austin Station, a few IRA men opened the attack on a group of soldiers in the carriage ahead of the troop carriage. The British military replied, killing three. Tom Keller, Jim Carney and Fleur Begley somehow managed to bring Charlie and then O'Mani to safety, though O'Mani died a few years later as a result of his wounds. 
Tom Barry knew that Charlie, who had led the ambush, was not alone physically but also emotionally wounded. However, he assured Charlie that had the scouts travelled and no extra troops got on, the attack would in all probability have been a success. It could be any commander's story, Barry said. However, he later discovered that the ambush had been sold, hence the extra soldiers. More bad news awaited Tom when he returned to the flying column on that evening of the 17th of February 1921. Forces had killed four volunteers in the Kilbritton Company area. Volunteers were road trenching in Krishnalana vicinity, and on the night of 16th of February, members of the Essex Regiment surprised them. The Cork Examiner reported that shots were heard in the district, and next morning four men were found dead in the field. Having returned from a brigade council meeting, Tom went to bed, but being worried, about the safety of the flying column, he rose shortly afterwards to check the sentries and have a general look around. In addition, sentries he had two sentries he had always placed in the precaution of protecting the flying column against surprise attacks by having an outer ring of scouts drawn from the local company. Those scouts were armed with revolvers, balling borrowed from the flying column to fire warning shots. In the event of being unable to slip back to billets to report approaching enemies. On this particular night, Tom, having visited the sentries, went to inspect the south ring of scouts. Pat O'Driscoll was relieving another man as Tom approached. To ensure that Pat knew his full responsibilities, he asked the man to detail his duties for the relief scout. Tom was close to both as he, they stood about a foot apart pace facing each other and the scout described his duties. About halfway through his description, a shot rang out and Pat swayed. Tom grabbed him and lowered him gently to the ground. He was dead. Tom turned to the man who had dropped his Webley revolver, horrified at shot having shot his best friend. When Tom spoke, he didn't answer. He gave a moan and collapsed. Apparently, Tom was, as Tom was speaking, he had been unconsciously fingering the trigger of his revolver and had unknowingly pressed the very light spring trigger. This was an incident Tom was to remember all of his life with sadness, as he felt it was the man's nervousness in his own presence that had caused the accident. There were two other fatal accidents with firearms in West Cork Flying Column. Captain Jeremiah O'Manny, who had fought in Kilmichael, was one night cleaning his rifle in December 1920 at home when it went off and shot him. Timothy Whaley died under similar circumstances and Johnny O'Brien of Trombuig escaped with his grazed head in an earlier incident. By early March 1921, enemy intimidation presented a problem for the flying column. Tom, accompanied by Mick Crowley and two other riflemen, went to Castletown, Kenna on brigade business. At nines, they were informed that on that morning, a Dunmanway Auxiliary Company had occupied the village of Balneen in force, rounded up all the men, and formed them into what they called civic guards. They instructed them to report on IRA movements and fill in IRA road trenches. With an auxiliary escort and under threat of death, they were forced to work. Instantly, Barry decided that this move of using civilians against Irishmen had to be cracked. With a few men, he went to the small hill about 400 yards from the road. Down below, they saw about two dozen civilians with shovels filling in a deep trench. Their escort lay in positions behind the adjoining fence, and all that could be seen were their berries and the barrels of their rifles. Barry instructed his companions to splatter the ground with shots and not to kill anyone. The auxiliaries replied, and the new civic guards scattered. When a few days later the auxiliaries tried to round up more men for their operation, they said they would prefer to be killed by the auxiliaries than by the IRA. 
So that trick by the forces wasn't tried again. In all cases, civilians were not to be inconvenienced, Barry decided. Alternative roads suitable for the horse and cart transport for ordinary people, but not suitable for army lorries, were to be mapped out. The anti Sinn Féin Society in Cork had held a special council meeting on December the 5th, 1920, and at it it was proposed and passed that in Bandon, where Crown forces may be molested, that Sinn Féin and IRA, whether leader or not, three persons were to be taken out and shot, and immediately after the chapel bell will toll. Further, it was decided that the houses and property of these people should be burned and their families taken and detained. To this end, notices were posted in Bandon. Remember, Irishmen, internment camps are ready for all suspicious persons. The safest thing for you to do is to take your hands out of your pockets if you have them in, or you are liable to be shot on sight. The notice ended, God save the king. God save Ireland, members of the Crown Forces. Barry and Guerrilla Days described the 2nd to the 14th of February 1921 as 12 dark days because during that period, 11 officers and IRA men were killed. Some, like the two coffee unarmed brothers, were killed near their homes. The killers were members of British Action Espionage Group, known as the Protestant Action Group. Paddy Crowley, battalion, a battalion commandant, was ill in bed at O'Neill's in Marlborough when Essex men raided the house. Unable to hide, he ran and was wounded, and they fell when he was wounded, he fell, and they shot him where he lay. Barry said that not one of the enemy had been killed during that period. He believed the morale of their units was bound to suffer if, if fatal casualties continued, with none inflicted on the enemy. Hundreds of young men with a, in a radius of 20 miles around Bandon were arrested, all reported being beaten and tortured. Some were hoisted as what was known as stool pigeons. They were made to go in military lorries that travelled the countryside on raids, and many men not involved in the IRA were jailed. According to General Percival, drumhead, drumhead court martials for dealing with rebels caught with arms in their hands were set up. Penalties for harboring rebels or for failing to report ambushes, etc., or for giving the wrong name were enforced. General Crozier recorded the following. Under auspices, a weekly incentive, I'm quoting now, under aus propaganda auspices, a weekly incentive to murder indiscriminately was issued to the police in the form of a weekly summary, printed and published by the British government. There were instructions to murder and ask questions after. These were issued secretly to secret police officers from Dublin Castle. The District County Inspector's weekly summary contains statistics, details of spies, casualties, burnings, killings from a propaganda point of view. The stamping out of terrorism by murder was instituted. This was what Crozier uh, quoted. For the future, Barry decided he would not show mercy to bend an Essex regiment under Percival as they continued to torture, wound, and kill defenseless IRA prisoners. They lacked mercy to the sick, the unarmed, and created havoc when raiding homes and burning many. Barry wrote, they had killed in us the virtue for mercy. Orders issued by me in 1921 were to shoot every member of the Essex at sight armed or unarmed, and not to accept their surrender under any circumstances. We had tried to play the game of war by the rules accepted by the civilized world, but no immunity had come to an end. In other areas, rules of war were to be observed. Mercy would be shown, but not in Bandon. Barry decided to have another go at the Bandon stronghold. He assembled a strong column of 44 volunteers on the 23rd of February for another attack on a curfew patrol. 
that is called men carried rifles and pistols and wore their you new know, uniforms, a khaki type coat with a cape at the back. As usual, Barry had them detailed and divided into sections for their approach to the town. At 8.20 p.m., they reached their chosen place of attack. Accurate timing was essential. Barry as column commander believed it was imperative that the decision of the time of to attack rested with him. He went forward alone, clearly visible under a full moon, clad in uniform, leggings, and full field equipment, and Mick Crowley followed the distance behind with a section. They crossed the bridge at the end of the town where they stopped. Barry went up South Main Street and met an IRA sympathizer who told him that the patrol was coming. Barry hurried back towards the scout to signal the column to advance. But as he waited, made his way back, the sound of marching feet and English voices brought him to an abrupt halt. His first reaction was to run. He and he said, it's amazing how quickly things run through your head when confronted with a situation, how quickly you think and dismiss thoughts. He was sure it was the end. There was no escape. Should he run for it? No. My reason flashed the warning that if I turned and ran, I, ran, I would be shot in the back. I stood my ground as five military rounded the North Main Street corner and advanced across the bridge towards me, he said. The gunfire commenced. Facing the enemy, Benny Barry opened fire with revolver in one hand and automatic in the other. Mick Crowley, whom he had posted at the north end of the bridge, joined in. The tan swinging his revolver as he came into view was the first to fall. A second staggered across the road and then fell. Barry missed the third as he sprang to the other side of the road, but Crowley got him. The fourth man had bolted back to the barracks at the sound of the first shots, and the fifth had dropped to the ground, as a trained soldier will do under fire. Now he leaped up, sprang round the corner, escaping the first shots aimed at him. Barry, who recognized him in a fury, ran after him, brandishing his guns but didn't fire because, he said, I was mad. I just wanted to get my hands on him. Confronting in a close-range situation, Barry had recognized him, Constable Perrier, known as a spy in a dreaded Essex regiment whom he had been watching, made him lose his temper. Perrier had made attempts to join the IRA under the guise of a deserter. I was guilty of the most senseless act in my life, for I ran after him, Barry admitted. A man who could be so disciplined and so insistent on discipline could view this action as a reckless act. On later reflection, he was critical of this action, as he said it was an irrational act, and he recorded that Perrier could have turned around and shot him. He described to me what happened. Still running, Barry slipped his revolver into his pocket to free his left hand. He retained the Colt automatic in his right hand. The panic-stricken soldier ran into an open doorway. As he cleared the small counter, Barry vaulted after him, grabbing him by the shoulder. He shook him and shot him twice at point-blank range. Are you all right in there, shouted Tom Keller, who had followed him. Keller remained at the door in case more British military should come along. I got the bloody fellow, said Barry, as he emerged. Why didn't you fire on him going in, Keller asked. I wanted to shake the bastard first. Unperturbed, Barry began to check his gun and reload it. You would think the British were a hundred miles away, Tom Keller recalled for me. Keller remembered. Barry shook himself, straightened his shoulders, a spy, pretending he was in sympathy with us. Barry bolted down the street to meet the remainder of the column who were dealing with the other patrol. As Keller and Barry ran, as Barry ran bullets were knocking sparks off the flagstones behind them. But as Jim Carney, ponderously recalling those times, said, there was never a bullet made to shoot Barry. Carney and Keller 
were among the many flying column participants whom I interviewed for my book, Tom Barry, IRA Freedom Fighter. So, there we have it. I must commend Mida on a fantastic podcast, fitting a huge amount of information into such a short amount of time. Not only are the events discussed a fascinating part of the Irish War of Independence, I find the most interesting aspect, the personal insights and the small nuances from the memories of those who were involved. Mida brings together excellently the vivid pictures of the war in West Cork from the perspective of the IRA. I just want to thank Mida for giving us her time in both piecing together the content and taking on the arduous task of recording this podcast. We are honoured and delighted to have such a distinguished guest and hope in the near future you will be able to join us in person as our guest at Michael Collins House. COVID-19 has tested our technical capabilities in the recording of this episode and has forced us to come up with an alternative method of creating our podcast. Um, this was our first remote recording, which we think was a success and hopefully our listeners do too. And um, We hope you will join us again for our next episode coming very soon. So that's it for this episode. My name is Jamie Murphy. Thank you for listening and goodbye. This podcast was brought to you by Michael Collins House, supported by Cork County Council and the Cork County Council Commemorations Committee.